Good morning and uh, welcome to the 17th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Can I ask everyone to switch their mobile phones on to silent? You can of course use them for social media but don't film or photograph proceedings. The first item on the agenda is subordinate legislation with four negative instruments to consider. Uh, the first instrument is Mental Health Tribunal for Scotland Practice and Procedure No. 2 Amendment Rules 2017. Uh, SSI 2017 172. There has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comment on the instrument. Could, could I invite any comment from members? No? Then that is agreed. Thank you very much. The second instrument is Mental Health Patient uh, Representation Persons Scotland Regulations 2017, SSI 2017 175. Again, there's been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comment on the instrument. Any comments from members? No, thank you, that is agreed then. And the third instrument is Mental Health Certificates for Medical Treatment Scotland Regulations 2017, SSI 2017 176. Again, no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comment on the instrument. Any comments from members? No, thank you, that is agreed. And the fourth instrument is the Mental Health Conflict of Interest Scotland Regulations 2017, SSI 2017 174. Again, there's been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comment on the instrument. Is there any comments from members? No, and that is agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item two is uh, a, a session on information technology uh, and security. Um, we have two panels today, and our uh, First panel uh, includes Professor Bill Buchanan, uh, the Cyber Academy Edinburgh and Napier University, Andy Robertson, Director of IT NHS Services Scotland, and Andy Greer, Acting Assistant Director of eHealth and Information Services NHS Ayrshire and Arm. Uh, we're going to move uh, directly to questions. So, uh, Claire, would you like to begin? Thank you very much, Convener, and uh, I'd like to welcome the panel to the committee this morning. Uh, we value your time. Um, can you tell us, first off, what happened? why it happened, and perhaps explain that in, in layman's language for us. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm Andy Robertson, for the Director of IT at the NHS National Services Scotland. Um, uh, essentially, there was a, uh, a release, and, and I don't th I think anyone's quite sure yet where it originated, um, uh, but there was a, uh, a virus found its way into the network. When I say the network, uh, we share a network and we, we're linked in with England. We have also um, uh, linkages into the internet from our, our, uh, our NHS network. And it found its way onto computers um, and exposing a particular um, um, uh, uh, issue we have, uh, I guess, in and around uh, some of the, the software that runs on some machines. Now, once infected, those machines and the nature of the virus were such that it tried to connect to other machines with similar exposures. And it's found its way through, um, the, the, the were, there were three layers of security that the, um, that the virus found its way through. If it found its way through a, a network port that was opened in particular, if it found itself with a, a piece of software that's designed specifically around file sharing, uh, and if, if it, indeed the machine hadn't been patched to the latest level of the, the Microsoft operating system, then it was able to spread through our network. Uh, as been advertised, the, the ransomware uh, nature of the virus was such that it was encrypting uh, files on those machines of different types. So it was effectively shutting down those machines as it travelled and, and moved through the network. So does that cover what actually happened? Yes. <laughs> if, you're that, if you're telling me that's what if you're telling me that's what happened, that's I, what I happened. guess in, in, yeah. terms, of, in okay. terms of why it happened, uh, the, it's exposures yeah. we we uh, we have, and when I say we have, it's exposures that uh, a number of organisations worldwide had in their uh, computer systems and yeah. networks. So, th so this was a, a, a virus that affected multiple systems internationally? Yes, and, and multiple organisations internationally. So it's a, a worldwide release. Okay. And why did it then affect the computers here, or the, health, the healthcare computers in, in Scotland? Okay, so the, the, the organisations that were impacted had, had uh, a number of things in common. 
so and, and including the health service here. Um, like I say, the, we, we were all using uh, a particular piece of software that, that shares information amongst computers uh, within the health service. That's fairly fundamental to how the, the health service operates on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a, a very linked and uh, a networked organisation, and, and data moves around the health service uh, that, that really maintains our services on an ongoing basis. Um, so we had we have some computers in the the health service running that particular piece of software. Um, we, uh, we 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 also make use of a particular um, network uh, configuration in and around our firewalls, where in some places this particular virus picked on one route through firewalls which uh, the, 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 the perpetrators, I guess, would, would understand would be an exposure uh, across the world and a particular port that's used in our firewalls. Uh, and it was really looking for machines that hadn't been patched up to the very latest uh, version of the Microsoft uh, software releases for those machines. And this was, a, a, this was common world? Well, so, so anyone who was impacted had the same set of circumstances across their environments. Okay. And in terms of the, the, the patch that wasn't applied, what was that? What, can you explain what, what that particular patch was that hadn't yeah, been applied? Why it hadn't been applied? Andy, can you explain the patch? So, so the patch um, was a Microsoft patch, and what that did was uh, actually just close, close one of the loopholes. That the um, that the virus used to to attack with it closed a, a specific network port. So in, in and I'm I'm asking here for for those who are technologically challenged and I include myself in that category. So so systems or software <coughs> systems inherently have these loopholes. Is that what you're saying? And then yeah. o operating well, op operating systems that run on our computer. So so just to to, to give you some context. Um, the virus reached 1% of the devices that run in the health service. So for the most part, for 99% of, of the uh, machines that this could have, could have reached, we were protected on 99% of those machines. 1% uh, for, and again, varying reasons, uh, hadn't been updated with that particular software patch from Microsoft. However, the other two layers of uh, security that we would have in our environment would normally be enough to keep that secure. Mm -hmm. So we, we receive patches all the time um, from Microsoft and other software vendors in terms of keeping our estate up to date uh, and secure. Uh, but each individual organization that has responsibility for deploying that patch needs to make local decisions in and around how often they would run their patching regime. So there's no okay. consistency across all of NHS Scotland? Well, you, you, uh, as I did, the, uh, across uh, NHS Scotland, there are 22 different health boards, all with their own accountability for managing their IT estate. Now, we're all conforming to the same uh, policy uh, and indeed the same guidelines and the same best practice. Um, but local decisions need to be made in and around um, when to apply patches and when not. Uh, some of that, those decisions are tied to the particular circumstances in local boards. It may be peculiar to, to specific parts of local boards' estates, uh, but that really needs to be managed locally based on local information. It also requires a downtime and sometimes an interruption to, um, to normal IT service delivery to apply some of these patches. So again, decisions are made locally in terms of how often you apply these patches. Uh, and, and what your regime is, uh, sits in and around that. You said varying reasons that the one percent weren't covered. What are some of those very various reasons? Um, it, it could be that the um, it could be just that the regime was due to run on uh, the next week or the next month. It could be something that was in testing locally. There could be complications in and around the. The software that runs when we receive patches, they need to be tested before we can deploy. Uh, sometimes patches that come in on an operating system will have a, a knock-on effect on some of the applications that run on them. Um, medical devices come in many shapes and sizes and, and require uh, operating system computers to, to be attached to them. Uh, and sometimes that can provide uh, reasons why it's difficult to, to, uh, to keep patches up to date. So, and what exactly was it that was affected? Was it 
a specific version of an operating system. That one, Andy? Mm. Yeah, it, uh, the press would have you believe it was mostly um, legacy operating systems such as Windows XP. However, um, evidence would suggest it was Windows 7. Um, so it, it wasn't restricted just to um, Windows XP. Okay, uh, Alison. Um, very much, convener. Um, thank you, panel, for joining us this morning. Um, Mr. Robertson, you, uh, in uh, responding to, to Claire Hoy, you suggested that the incident had exposed a particular issue we have. Um, and I'd probably like to direct my questions to Professor Buchanan, if I may. Um, thank you for your evidence. I found it fairly accessible. Um, quite an interesting read. Um, you suggest that the main lesson that we have to learn from this in incident is a complete underinvestment in the delivery of IT infrastructure in the NHS. You go on to say that, um, well, there, that there's a lack of integration across different stakeholders, that in general we're lagging behind England when it comes to this infrastructure, that healthcare has the poorest track record for computer security, that medical records are incredibly valuable to criminals. Um, and I suppose all of this um, sort of, <laughs> it paints quite a, a picture of concern. And it seems too that experts in this field who will enable us to, to protect ourselves in future are in short supply. Can I just ask then, was this avoidable? It, it was avoidable. Uh, the, the, the problem is to do with that file sharing protocol, which is used on, on the Windows operating system. It wasn't needed at all. So in many industries such as oil and gas, finance, in Edinburgh you'll find one of the most advanced security operation centre infrastructures probably in the whole world. Uh, many of our graduates go and work for many of the finance industry. The use of virtualised infrastructure, the, the days of computer systems with technicians walking around with disks to patch are, are gone. These days you should have a dynamic infrastructure where machines are patched every evening this was a critical patch. The critical is the highest level. If you want to, to use a, a, something from Spinal Tap, this was an 11 out of, of 10 in terms of its, uh, of its threat. So it should have been patched uh, and it was well known and it was a race for the industry to catch up with the patch before those with the skills to, to make something malicious uh, turn uh, their, their evil hands to, to, to something else. So I think we got out of this uh, this this very 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 well, but it, it could uh, happen that it would be much more uh, severe. So I think we really need to look at the whole health and social care infrastructure in Scotland. We struggle to integrate between primary and secondary health care just now, where in England uh, it's happened much easier. In London, there is the open data sharing partnership where they've managed to get all the the health authorities to share information, what's allowed to be shared and what isn't allowed to be shared. That includes dentists, community practice, GPs, hospitals and so on. And generally it's a more citizen focused uh, approach. I think in Scotland we really struggle with even that integration with uh, social care. So our systems are legacy and we need to admit that. We're now in a data age, an information age, where data is critical for the preemptive uh, understanding uh, as to whether someone uh, is, is, is at risk for, for their health. So I think we need a, a, a massive increase in, in spending, not just in computers, but in really looking at, at healthcare services and how we provide that to the citizen. I mean, are you hopeful that this may be seen as a wake-up call and that we can take action so that this is avoided in future? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, there has generally been a resistance to IT and, and healthcare. Uh, it gets in the way. And that's typically because services have been designed in a way that doesn't make it easy for GPs and clinicians and nurses, the most important people, to be able to use the, the, the systems. So I think we need to create a, a, an ecosystem around innovation in Scotland we need to support SMEs to be engaged with the NHS and to work with clinicians about how best to analyse the, pa the patient pathway. An outage of a day, a week, as we've seen with BT and Capita, could cause economic and, and, and the, the, the loss of, of lives in, in Scotland. Uh, a large-scale power outage would cause much more effect than 
uh, a simple ransomware attack. Can I ask if you think there's sufficient knowledge of this area within the NHS? It's difficult for them to recruit staff. The, the finance industry, energy will, will pick off the best graduates, will pick off the best professionals. It is extremely difficult, as we do in education, to be able to recruit the best security professionals. Uh, so I, I think we're, we're, we're getting there, but it is actually difficult on the resources. And because we have the 22 health boards, it's actually very difficult to manage an, an incident because we've got to corral all the different health boards. They have different systems. They have a lot of legacy within there. So I think this must be a 10 to 20 year journey that we must go on. But we're moving to the cloud, not the public cloud, but we're moving much more towards virtualized architectures that are much more robust and resilient. In the NHS, we should have warm sites. A warm site is where if you have a power outage in one area, we can switch over to another area. And we should definitely have a cold site, which is the data infrastructure of the NHS set up somewhere else in Scotland. It doesn't have to be in Scotland, but where we can flip over to that site just in case there's a major outage. Okay. Can I ask one further question, Convener? Um, you say in your written submission that we need to build systems on a white list of trusted systems and where all other connections and systems are not trusted. So this is obviously about putting in place a structure that helps prevent this occurring in future. People in, in security are now realising that rather than having a blacklist, the things that you're not allowed to connect to, you have a white list, which are the things that you should connect to. The NHS is such a critical system, it should be in lockdown that the least privilege is given to every service and every role. Only by escalating that privilege can you move up and get higher privileges. So the NHS needs to work on uh, this is what's allowed and, and everything else is barred. So connection to Tor, the dark web and so on should be barred automatically. Uh, there needs to be much more responsiveness to attacks and to have an instant response team. But this isn't something that's just happening in Scotland. In the US, cyber security and health is rated in a, in a critical uh, condition at, at the current time. Thank you very much. We're, we were going to run a jargonometer in this session. Well, that wasn't the term I used, but you'll get the inference. Um, so we've got virtualised architecture, TOR, and, uh, and other such terminology. Um, can you help us with virtualised architecture? Yeah, virtualised means that uh, rather than being dependent upon a piece of hardware, a, a computer, uh, a processor, now your, your desktop is now running in the cloud. It's a piece of software. It doesn't actually run on the hardware of the computer. You're using the computer as a portal. You can have the simplest of computers and you can access the most complex of infrastructures with inside uh, the cloud. That's the way that most companies work now, most businesses. Uh, you can go anywhere in the world, you can sit in Starbucks. I hate to bring up a bit of tech here, but you have a VPN, a virtual private network connection between you and your infrastructure, and then you run your desktop uh, virtually on, on your machine, which means that none of the files, none of the ransomware, the malware can actually run on your computer. The cloud infrastructure, the virtualization infrastructure, can make checks all the time and can update patches at any given time. Typically overnight, your desktop will be patched. So the concept of taking six weeks to patch, I can't understand that at all, especially for a critical patch. And the problem with the NHS is that they have so many disparate computers distributed around the network that are still allowed to connect these days they shouldn't, they would be given a certain amount of time to, to update themselves to the latest systems or they're off the network completely. I'll be dropping virtualised architecture into conversations all day. <laughs> uh, Jenny, Jenny. One, one last thing for, for. for Tor and for the dark web. So uh, the ransomware connected straight to the dark web. So it didn't go to any normal website, it didn't go to any bank or PayPal or anything like that. It downloaded what's called the Tor browser, which is the dark web. It encrypts all its traffic. You can't see what it's doing. So even though you're watching what it's doing, you can't see it. It connected straight into the dark web. 
and into a Bitcoin uh, infrastructure. So uh, the NHS needs to understand that any connection into the dark web is malicious. It could be that someone's trying to hide something or could be downloading a whole lot of patient records. Uh, the NHS needs to understand that it should bar anything that, uh, that tries to hide its path. Jenny. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the panel. I, I'd just like to go back to my colleague uh, Claire Hoy's point at the start. Um, she asked how this all began, and I, I really would like to ask a question about how the virus transferred. Um, was it via email in the first instance? I suppose, Andy Robertson, you were speaking about this initially. No, it didn't. Uh, we're fairly sure it didn't come in through email, and it didn't come in through anyone um, connecting to a, a compromised website, which is, uh, there are a number of different places we look when, when our, um, uh, I guess, our defences are breached. And uh, we're fairly sure that, that this didn't come in through an email and it didn't come in through anyone uh, clicking on a, a, web, a website that perhaps they received through an email. Um, we're fairly sure this came in through our, our, um, our connection into the N3 network. So we run the SWAN network in Scotland, the Scottish Wide Area Network that's used by the health service. And we have a gateway to the English health service through something called the N3 gateway. Um, and it, the, the virus reached us either through that connection or, or indeed through the internet, perhaps both. Um, and I understand that once the computer becomes infected, it locks the files and encrypts them so that you can't access them. Um, and it sometimes demands payment via Bitcoin. Um, are you aware of anybody in Scotland making payment via that system? Because what I've, from what I've read, um, it was demanding payment. And if people didn't pay within a set number of days, then the payment could increase. That, that's the nature of, of how it, it shows itself uh -huh. to the, the user of a device. Um, no one in the health service has ever paid any ransom. It's our policy not to ever pay that. Um, I don't know if anyone in Scotland from other organisations mm -hmm. that were impacted uh, paid, paid that. Yeah. Um, the, it, it does try to encourage you to, to pay quickly. Uh, if you mm -hmm. don't pay quickly, then the price goes up. Yeah. Um, but uh, essentially what we do in those circumstances is, is, is we give up on that machine in terms of its current state and we mm -hmm. restore it to the last good position we would have in terms of our, our, our restoration policy. Okay. So we would restore the machine to, to prior to its infected state. And that's what we were able to do in uh, just about every circumstance, I think, mm -hmm. for, for the 1% of machines that were impacted. So you, you, you can guarantee that there will be continued attacks on the NHS and other organisations. Mm -hmm. uh, cyber crime is a huge industry now, yeah. uh, and that the stakes are being raised every day. We know that and we're going to have to, uh, we are going to have to spend more money on our defences. I, I agree with Professor Buchanan in terms of uh, how that, that, that uh, I, I don't think our, our picture of, of where the NHS is at is quite as, as, as dark as perhaps uh, that was painted. We are taking all of those types of steps that, that Professor Buchanan laid out in his paper and, and uh, what he's mentioned. Um, but we, we certainly um, are in a position where we were able to recover the health service. Uh, the vast majority of services were up on the Monday morning. This happened at three or four o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Uh, we were able to recover all of our uh, key services by the Monday morning. There were the one or two um, subsequent issues just based on having had a major incident over the weekend that took us a few days into the new week. But we think our, our defences worked fairly well in terms of the uh, the impact that it had on the health service, and we think where, where we were breached, we were able to recover as per our uh, recovery plans and our disaster recovery uh, regimes. Thank you. And, and just a, a final question. Um, obviously, not all health boards were affected in the same way, so I think NHS Lanarkshire and the borders uh, were two of the worst affected in Scotland. And in comparison, uh, Lothian, Orkney and Shetland were not affected at all. So I just wonder if you, you know why that might be the case. And I appreciate... Uh, Adjugainer, that you said that this doesn't relate to the varying operating systems. I'm not necessarily sure if it relates to the fact that these uh, boards were perhaps directly connected to the N3 network that you spoke about in the answer to my question. We're all connected to the, the, the N3 network. We're all connected to the N3 network. Right, um, so that rules that out. Same. So uh, if I can go back, and, and, and I'll answer one because it related back to, to um, the same three set of circumstances. So you needed to be using a particular file sharing 
uh, software that again Professor Buchanan referred to earlier on. You needed to have a certain circumstance of rules in and around your firewall and you needed to be in a certain position in and around your patching regime for this to impact you. So as much as, as that's the reasons why it reached the health service at all, those, were, those same reasons apply to why some boards were impacted more than others. Okay, thank you. Tom? Good morning to the panel. On a, a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being the least sophisticated and 10 being the most sophisticated, where would you place the WannaCry virus? Do you, do you want to add? So I think this was uh, probably one or two. Uh, I'd, uh, some, so there's a, a kill switch. So the developers who make these, uh, these, these, these malware uh, systems will put in a, a kill switch. And the kill switch is that the first thing that it does is it checks something. So what it did was it checked uh, a certain domain name. There was two domain names that it checked to see if they were actually registered on the internet. And someone in England found out that it was making this call and registered those two domains and stopped it. So it killed it. It would have been much worse that if that hadn't actually been uh, uh, in in there, but that was the core of it. So it uh, it didn't really have a great defence. So it probably wasn't sort of created by uh, someone with large scale investment in in creating really malicious infrastructures. If you see the energy infrastructure in the Ukraine has been attacked uh, fairly uh, a, a fairly complex uh, uh, malware which attacks the. Uh, control systems for the energy infrastructure that has uh, quite a, a large investment in it. But in terms of, of WannaCry, it was fairly easy to detect when it was connecting to the dark web and to stop the connection then. So really it wasn't a, 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 a complex uh, piece of malware and it could have been much, much worse. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, could you perhaps sketch out for the committee what an attack in the sort of 7, 8, 9 or 10 end of the scale would look like? And further from that, comment whether you think we have the resilience within the IT system in NHS Scotland to uh, deal with such an attack at that level? Well, I, I would say it splits into four key risks. Distributed denial, denial of service, which is very difficult to protect against, and that's where... Uh, malicious agents across the internet will target certain systems and consume all the resources, which means that they, 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 they fall over and, and, and they fail. Then you can get a domino effect where other systems will fail. A good example is, uh, sorry to, to talk technical here, but is DNS, a domain name system. It happened in the US recently where there was a Facebook outage and what was happening is that web cameras, half a million web cameras across the world were infected by malware, all had the same username and password. And these cameras directed themselves onto the DNS infrastructure, the thing that resolves the IP address for Facebook, and brought down that infrastructure. That meant that nobody could connect to Facebook. It might seem trivial, but imagine if it was NHS systems that couldn't resolve the names of the IP addresses of the systems that they that they actually connect to, so that brought down uh, Facebook for four for four hours uh, because of that, that attack. So denial of service can do that. Um, a, a serious malware infection, which could go to the core of NHS systems and start to switch off or corrupt databases. So we we have uh, legacy databases. And it's possible for a malware to possibly take over a database and encrypt it. Luckily, the, the computers in this case were, the were at the periphery of the network. But a piece of malware which was targeted on the NHS in Scotland could target key uh, data elements and bring down the, the data infrastructure. The next threat is a large-scale data loss. Uh, and that's where patient records could be compromised in some way and and migrated off the network to be sold onto the the dark the dark web, and I think the last one and the, the scariest one for us is a large scale power outage. Like it or not, planes will fall from the sky, uh, traffic lights will fail in London and cause chaos. We are highly dependent upon our IT infrastructure, 
and a large-scale power outage if somebody was to trip the power uh, supply for a, a key resource in the NHS, it could cause the whole of the infrastructure uh, to, to fail. Uh, hopefully that won't happen and that we've got things in place, but I think looking at Scotland and that the way that, that Scotland is organised for its key critical network connections, we use London a lot. You'll find if I communicate with you, probably the data packet will go all the way down to London and come back up again. Uh, so if we were to lose critical connections to the internet, typically to London, we'll bring down all our, our, our industry, education, health, finance and so on. And the economic effect of that would be devastating for a, for a country like, like Scotland. Uh, hopefully there's lots of things in place, but I, I think having failover backup routes for network connections and for power is a, is a core part of what we need to look at. Do you feel that... Obviously, that was your own opinion, Professor McCann. What about the other uh, panel members? Um, uh, my opinion is th th those are all threats, but um, they're all threats we are well aware of. Uh, we've had uh, the, the distributed, the, the um, I think Professor McCann called it the DDoS attack, where, where it's a very different nature of, of kind of uh, the cyber threat, where people are, are trying to maliciously bring down your your websites and uh, and uh, internet facing services, so we know about that. We know about the power outage. Just to, to give the the, uh, the 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 panel some assurance here, the committee some assurance, uh, we have a a very resilient uh, data centre uh, based in Livingston, so so not in London, but based in Livingston, where we um, manage most of our large scale national infrastructure out of. We have a, a contract with Atos. Atos run a large data centre for us. It's uh, it's it's almost a, a tier four data centre that runs in Livingston. It has two different uh, power cables into it. It's resilience in terms of its power supply. It has the the UPS battery backup, and it has generators. Should we we run into that? Um, there are a number of other measures we would take. So uh, just to, to give the, the committee some assurance, we, we are aware of these types of threats. There are steps we've taken. Uh, the, the work that we do to cover all threats uh, to the, the, uh, the systems that we run in the health service, uh, it's quite wide ranging. So this was a particular attack. Um, um, I think you asked about the, the nature of the attack and how sophisticated it was. It was almost sophisticated in its simplicity in terms of how it how it breached the the networks and, and the the uh, the way in which it compromised that particular exposure. And you can see from the reach of that that was worldwide. It wasn't just the health service that had the exposure, but in terms of the other more malicious um, types of attack we might come under, uh, we do uh, have measures in place to protect ourselves against just about every every item there. The frame that what we use covers a broad range of security and, and safety measures we would have in place that uh, that would cover that, that range of, of different ways in which uh, you may well be attacked. Let me just uh, move on to something else. Um, as we move seemingly inexorably towards the Internet of Things, this is something I imagine is going to have an impact, of course, upon how we uh, deliver healthcare. Um, I think we're aware of some of the opportunities this um, presents us with, but what about the challenges and particularly the uh, vulnerabilities that this will uh, engender? Yeah, uh, address that uh, question. Um, the Internet of Things really within the NHS is already here. Um, <clears throat> most medical, significant medical devices in hospitals these days are computers within their own right and are connected to the network. So one area of mitigation we, we use um, within NHS Asia and Aaron uh, to combat any, any threat against this Internet of Things is we have a separate network for medical devices. So anything that isn't a desktop PC or a server sits on a, a separate network and only has the appropriate ports open um, to allow access to that device. So whether that could be a, a, an MRI scanner or a syringe driver or a pump, they, they all sit on a separate network so that we can monitor and control that network separately and provide a degree of assurance. Uh, of the network services. And you feel confident that we will not be vulnerable to the types of attack that we've been discussing? I would never give a 100% guarantee, um, 
but certainly we were we were largely unaffected Ayrshire and Arran um, during this recent incident. And, and given the the sensitivity of a, a separate network for the Internet of Things, is there, I presume there's um, special measures in place um, in addition to existing measures to deal with any such attack, given the impact this can have on patient wellbeing and potentially life? Yeah, absolutely. If, if we think about some of the um, radiology devices in particular, um, so sh should they you know, start to compromise our, our corporate network, we can, we can disconnect them from the network. They will still tend to operate as normal. Um, it's just that the images wouldn't be available across the network. It would require the clinicians to actually go to the devices rather than make them available. Thank you. Say Ivan. Yeah. Um, I just want to go back and explore a wee bit more about, we started off talking about the, the cause of this particular attack and the application of patches. And Professor Buchanan, just to clarify, if I heard you right, you were saying that certainly in, in, in our own machines at home, when you get a patch update, the kind of thing comes up and says, you want to update the latest version, you click yes and it goes and does it. Um, I'd assumed that that's what was happening, but you were kind of indicating that we're at a situation where that doesn't happen and you get technicians wandering about with disks updating machines. Is, is that an accurate portrayal of, of where we are? I couldn't say exactly. Uh, I, I, I did hear some people say that there were people walking around patching machines, but uh, these days what should happen is an orderly patching system, uh, I think that was identified earlier, uh, companies will have a patching system where at, in the evening you will patch all, all the machines automatically. So the concept of somebody having to go to a machine and update it really is, is an archaic 1970s uh, ty type of role. The NHS should have a, a general policy of watching the analytics and knowing what needs to be patched. What are the top 10 things that need to be patched at this uh, given time? And I don't think there was any excuse for missing this one. Uh, probably the core infrastructure was well protected and patched, but it's probably the computers at the periphery of the network. And they shouldn't have been allowed to, to connect into the infrastructure and propagate the, the ransomware. I understand that. Thanks very much. Maybe either of the Andes want to comment on that, just in terms of where, just specifically on that, how we, how we update. Yeah, if I could uh, take that one. Um, certainly speaking for NHS Asia and Aaron, I don't recognise the comments made by Professor Buchanan. We automate our, our uh, patch delivery and for our core infrastructure that happens overnight and for our desktop PCs, our, our peripheral PCs, that happens during the day and it happens within certainly within one week of patches being released. And I think that that's evidenced by the minimal impact that this uh, WannaCry uh, exploit had for Escher and Aaron. So, so speaking for Escher and Aaron. I can only speak for Escher. Right, okay. And I can certainly speak for, for NSS and then perhaps for the broader. We, we have, uh, in, in, in National Services Scotland, we have, we have responsibility for guidelines across the other 21 health boards as well as looking after our own estate. Um, the vast majority, and when I say vast majority, I, again, I want to put this in context, you know, 99% of the NHS's estate here was unaffected by this virus. Um, for the, the vast majority of cases, all of that is automated. We don't run around doing this uh, with, uh, with disks. We, we, we will have complex environments where uh, the consideration, and I mentioned right up front, the consideration of when to apply patches is a judgment call based on uh, service delivery, the, the level of risk, and other layers of security you would consider to have in place to keep yourself safe during that environment. Now, again, it's difficult, we realise, for us to sit here and say, now that we have been breached by this particular uh, um, this particular virus, that, that we had all of that covered. Uh, obviously, we didn't, but I, I don't think we were the only organisation um, to have that particular exposure. Um, now, we, we have automated this uh, as, far as, uh, as far as we can uh, under the circumstances, but we have 150,000 devices connected to the NHS network in, in Scotland. We have 3,500 sites to cover. Um, we have GPs, pharmacists, optometrists, uh, um, and uh, 
uh, who who essentially <coughs> operate on on their sites with with varying different uh, levels of connection into our network. So it would be ideal if if we could um, take people off the network if they were not in, entirely compliant with with last night's patch. But that's a, an impractical consideration for a, an enterprise such as the NHS in Scotland, just with our sheer scale and complexity and reach. Hey. So just to be clear, you're saying that there are some, it may only be 1%, but there are some machines that were some days having to go around and manually update the patches. Uh, I don't, <coughs> there's very little, Andy, I would guess, and I'll, 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 I'll bow to Andy, who knows the technical detail better than I. Uh, it's not so much whether you have to physically visit the site, it's making the decision to take the services down to apply the patches okay. and to, to live without the service whilst you do that maintenance okay. uh, on, on a less okay. than regular nightly basis. Okay. Um, the next question is, is there some kind of measure or, or how much visibility do you have on where we are with patch update? Now, I mean, I'll maybe comment on it, but Professor Buchanan said this is one that was an absolute must, absolutely should have been done, the patch absolutely should have happened as soon as possible. And clearly there'll be there'll be degrees of, of, of how critical it is to implement certain patches. But, but across the piece, across the NHS, is there a visibility of, of where we are with patch update or... Or do we not really have that? Certainly we would have that at the health board level, whether we would have that nationally. Um, I, I, I wouldn't have visibility to that at the national right. level, but each health board um, is accountable for its own IT security. So people in, in positions such as myself and Andy would understand our areas of responsibility. Okay. And okay. we'd understand exactly where we are with patch versions across our estate. Right, okay. Uh, and the last question is, has anybody done any estimate of what the cost to the health service was of this attack, the downtime it caused and the recovery processes we had to go through to bring things back up? We don't have a number to hand right now. Okay. Um, the, and in terms of the cost, um, I, I think most of the, the IT uh, um, resources that went into that is, is sunk cost. It was our, we used our own resources, we used our own staff to recover. Okay. Uh, we didn't have to uh, go spend uh, any real uh, significant amount of money outside what we already spend in terms of the, the people, the resources, the expertise, the tools, and the, the uh, you know, other resources we would use to protect and re recover our network. Um, I just say that the recovery side of things is, is, is important now. Uh, the, the best practice and the advice we get uh, around the piece is one of you can protect yourself, um, but you, you can also assume that the, the level of sophistication of these types of attacks is going to increase and you need to be able to recover. So we've already invested in that ability to recover in terms of backups and the tools and the, the staff we need to be able to recover. Um, this is going to, it's a bit of a race though, uh, that that requirement is, is going to increase as we go forward as, as these types of attacks get more sophisticated. Okay, thanks. We don't have that figure at the moment. Will that figure exist at some point in the future or are you just saying that it was absorbed internally? I, I don't think that, that we have... Uh, we could certainly pull that figure together based That'd on the helpful. amount of, of, of uh, time and money that was spent from our... Uh, 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 most of it was done on the goodwill of, of IT staff who are already in our employ, I would say, on the back of that. But that's certainly a figure that could be calculated. It's maybe an issue in itself that we rely on the goodwill of the staff in such circumstances. But anyway, you could provide us with that information if you have it. Um, Colin. Good morning to the panel. Mr Robson, you seem to be saying basically that you provide central guidance, central examples of best practice, but the problem really lies in the fact that there are 21 health boards all doing their own thing, basically. Um, so are, are you saying that if all the health boards had followed specifically the guidance you had issued, this problem wouldn't have happened? Um, the, the way in which the health service uh, IT governance works is based on a, a kind of it's a, it's a coalition of, of the willing. Um, we are not in, in a position to, to issue, uh, or, and, and indeed we don't audit what happens in local health boards. Uh, we do try to collect best practice. I think boards try to apply that to their own circumstance as best they can. Um, I think that uh, there are obviously there, there are some boards here who were un unimpacted by uh, by the virus and by the incident. 
Uh, and I think it's fair to say if all boards were, were at the same level as those that were un unimpacted, then yeah, there would have been a lot uh, uh, significantly less impact. But that impact was limited in, in, its, uh, in its reach as it was. Going board, what you're saying about you don't have enforcement, if you like, but, but are you saying, though, specifically that the reason why those boards that weren't impacted is because they followed your guidance and, and had all the um, uh, boards followed specifically what you were saying, this wouldn't have happened, or is it just something they did off their own backs? I mean, I'm just trying to get to the, the bottom of, of, of... If we were all at the same stage as the best practice that, that, that reaches across the country, so, so different boards are, are, are better at different things across the country, there is a picture, and, and we were already there in terms of understanding what that picture looks like. But uh, if everyone was at that same high level, or the high watermark across the country of, of different boards, then yes, that, that would have been uh, there would have been zero impact. So, so just looking at this specific example, and uh, Professor Buchanan said this this patch was a must, effectively. So you would have known that this patch was a must. So did you issue guidance that said effectively, you know, you really, as a matter of urgency, should update your systems with this patch? Uh, I don't think we issued anything in particular to this patch. We receive patches on a very frequent basis uh, across our estate. Uh, let's say it's a very large estate, and it's a daily occurrence for us to get patches. I think, Andrew, that's uh, yeah, fair to say. Fair. Yeah, across the different types of software that runs. So this one didn't stick out to us as being anything uh, special beyond the, the normal types of patching we receive from Microsoft. And as I mentioned earlier on, uh, we have multiple layers of security uh, in our environment in terms of protecting us. So the, the, the fact that we receive a patch one night, if we don't deploy it the next night, we have another two layers of security that should keep us in place. And let's like say there are different reasons why we would uh, uh, we would schedule that patch. Now again, 99% of the, of the estate uh, was patched to that level and, and was covered uh, during, the, during the attack. But uh, there was nothing unusual about this one uh, and it's something that we we uh, we would work with our normal patching regime, uh, unless there was truly something that came out and said uh, truly emergency. So there's nothing different about this one in terms of its urgency to that which we would normally receive. Professor Buchanan's written submissions is quite a, a comprehensive, I suppose, dismantle of where we are in terms of the technology. It talks, for example, there's no need for us to use the type I think file sharing systems that you mentioned earlier. Um, we could be using, I won't go into the, the, the technology, but we, we could be using a, a virtual system that would avoid um, using that type of, of system that we currently use. So why are we not moving to using that type of system at the moment? We are moving to using that type of system. A, an example I can give you is that the, the uh, GP systems that run in our surgeries across the country, so in, in a thousand GP surgeries, has run on a locally hosted system for a, a fairly long time now uh, since we started running um, um, uh, GP systems in local surgeries. We are uh, very shortly going to, to market to look for the next generation of GP systems which will run in the cloud. Uh, and when I say run in the cloud, that means they will be remotely hosted. Uh, and as Professor Buchanan laid out, they, they will run in a secure data centre and be accessed across a network rather than being uh, situated in computers within uh, GP surgery. We're also doing that with our PC estate. We are looking at how we move that to secure data centres. Uh, uh, I don't disagree with anything that Professor Buchanan laid out, but uh, it is a huge investment, and I mean a huge investment, to, to transfer our systems to a, a different next generation of computing, as, as I think you, you, would, you would agree that, uh, that this represents. So the world is moving there. We are moving there as well. Um, but it's, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, we have a very large estate and a very large number of uh, stakeholders. I say 150,000 devices, 165,000 users, 3,500 sites. It's going to take us time and money to get there. So what level of investment will be needed to get there? Um, we, I would say we don't have that, that end number. I, I couldn't quote you a number right now in terms of uh, where that would take us, uh, but it would be, uh, it would be uh, significant amounts of money, so tens if not hundreds of millions of pounds to do that. We spend around £260 million pounds a year uh, on services within the health service. Um, so just to give you an idea of the scale in terms of how much money we would spend across the health service on IT as it stands. 
But, but are you being, given the fact that one of the Roses Committee is obviously to look at budgets and the government will have to look at budgets as well, given the, the seriousness of this issue, um, are you looking at how much it would cost to get to where you need to be? Yes, we, we're working with the government and with boards to look at the, our, 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 uh, our programme of work over the next few years. We would work through the, the what was the eHealth Strategy Board in terms of putting forward here are our programmes of work across a number of different fronts with acute, with primary care, with our infrastructure, with our PCs, and then what we would be doing for GPs, what we would do with our master patient index, what we would do with our patient facing systems. So we, we've got a programme of work laid out and we've, we've laid out uh, an amount of money, but that, that would require increased investment over coming years and it's not clear if that will be available or not. So, 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 so you do know how much it would it would be required to deliver this thing? Um, I, the, the, I, I could quote, a, in terms of the numbers, uh, we, we are looking at increases of, of in the region of about £15 million a year uh, to, to ramp up our programmes to be able to move to this new environment. Okay. £15 million increase, what would the total be? Well, that, in terms of the spending, that, that's on national, uh, and, national and centralised uh, projects. So you're saying an increase of 15 million. Yes. So so currently we we would be spending round about um, uh, the, the, I think the the number round about 100 million a year comes centrally for central managed programs and, and that's that's the, the type of thing that that uh, NSS gets involved in. So when we we look at projections out there would be an increase of around about 15 million pounds a year. Uh, that, that would be required to, to allow us to, to move uh, a, a bit faster in terms of what we're doing just now, in terms of moving to new environments. Professor Buchanan, have you uh, or your um, university uh, or colleagues made an estimate of where, what they think needs spent in this regard? I, I think you need to add a zero and then maybe another zero. Uh, I mean, this is our core, our, our core health and social care infrastructure. I, I think 15 million patches it, it keeps it going, it, it's a sticking plaster, but really we need to invest massively. It's good to see uh, the DHI uh, making inroads about uh, innovation. I think there needs to be more openness and uh, to a certain extent with research and innovation to make sure that SMEs in Scotland have the opportunity to work with the NHS. And I know that is, it is happening, but if you really want things to go, fast, then, then you've got to support innovation. You've got to support the growing of companies, great little cloud companies, and not go with the old model of large faceless companies running legacy systems and keeping virtual monopolies on their infrastructure. Uh, I think you've got to have a much more open system for review and not to, to pick faults, but to really look at how best you can share. You have the finance industry in Edinburgh, is one of the most uh, uh, one of the best security infrastructures that, that, that you have probably in, in the world. There's a lot of professionals around that could give support about how you how you go from legacy systems towards uh, this new health and social care environment, and it will grow a new economy. Uh, and I think, from a citizen point of view, I don't think our health and social care really integrates. Why did a, a, a company based in Sky? have to go down to London with their e-read book. Uh, and now every child who's born in London has an e-read book. My grandson has a paper-based read book, which is great, <laughs> but the natural extension onto that is an electronic uh, healthcare record. So I don't think we've talked about, we've talked negative about this ransomware and things like that, but I think we really need to understand how we can really grow a new healthcare infrastructure and design it around the citizen rather than around the NHS and the workflow patterns that are there uh, j just now. Marie. Uh, thank you. Convener, and thank you, panel. Um, I'm actually really excited by what you say there. I think it would be um, a huge advantage if data that is collected about the individual citizen belonged to the citizen and they decided who could look at it and who could share it. And I think it would overcome one of the massive barriers that we have in healthcare, which is data sharing. And yet, you know, I worked in psychiatry for 20 years. People tell the same story time and time again and get tired of and traumatised by having to tell the same story again because the data isn't 
shared. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit more about your vision and what is required to get there. Well, I think, I think we've always found London as a good role model as a city who really looks after their, their care. It's a similar sized population, more in, in fact, but they've managed to really uh, define a data sharing policy across London and how data is shared. Because London has a demographic similar to Scotland. We go in areas like Chelsea and Westminster from, from deprived areas to, to, to affluent areas. So I think we need to understand how the data should flow, but also to protect the rights of the individual to privacy. That's a really difficult balance to, to make, but it does involve the citizen understanding about what information they should hold and what they should own. But I think a, a, a building block is definitely the, the, the e-read book. It just seems unnatural to go from a paper-based system. When we go into hospitals, we still see the early warning score system for risk assessment still done as a, as a pen and paper exercise, which means that you're not gathering information that you could use to be able to predict uh, illnesses and, and so on. Uh, so, so I think there's some good work going on in Scotland, but we've always found that uh, London is the place where innovation thrives. So if there's some way that Scotland could, could foster new infrastructures, and especially around the health and social care integration, which seems to be the biggest barrier just now. How do we care in the home and how do we make sure that people aren't admitted into hospitals when they don't need to? That's providing the information to the first responders, the ambulance staff, to have enough analytics that they're not spying on the person, but to know the prescriptions that they're actually on and the risks to that patient. Uh, and a lot of that isn't medical data, it can be socio-economic uh, data. Uh, relates to the decision. So I think we could do things a, a lot smarter, but it does bring a whole lot of security problems. So I think if we were open as a, as a nation, then we could really create the, the best uh, infrastructure possible. Yeah, and I think, I mean, moving on to the security issues, so I'm, I'm also where we spent an awful long time talking about malicious attack of our um, IT systems, when in actual fact, one of the largest security threats is just human error. So what have we got in place to protect us against human error, people looking at stuff that they shouldn't, or being able to look at stuff that they shouldn't, people sending emails to the wrong folk and not blinding them, all of these standard security threats that happen on a day-to-day -day basis? The risks and security are people, people, and people. So I, I think you can put the best encryption. I found that quite recently, That's didn't right, they? Yeah. Uh, so a lot of that is staff awareness. And most ransomware will come in through a phishing email and people clicking on, on a link that they're not meant to. Most data will be leaked from the infrastructure by, by a, say, a doctor sending an email back to their Gmail account and getting the email address uh, wrong. So I think there needs to be a skilling up of all staff in, in the NHS and across the public sector about how they can cope and to be continually probing. Most companies now will do some sort of a assessment test against their employees, such as conduct a, a fake phishing attack and see who clicks on it. And then if they do, they're, they're then sent on a, on a, on a training course. Uh, so I really couldn't uh, go into detail about the specifics though. Maybe I, uh, if I could uh, just maybe add something there from, from NHS Asia and Aaron. So um, we are just about to actually conduct our first fishing campaign, just to see how the staff react to that and see see where there's flaws. In terms of upskilling that education and that awareness, and, and we've certainly uh, tried to communicate, well, we do communicate with our staff at, at various levels around uh, education and uh, of malware and, and the associated risks. Um, it is always human nature, though, that sometimes errors, errors do occur. In terms of the clinicians, though, um, looking at medical records inappropriately, uh, we use a, a platform called Fair Warning. Uh, it's rolled out uh, throughout Scotland in the NHS that actually picks up on should a clinician be accessing their record, a, a family member's record, somebody from from around the corner. So that, that's quite comprehensive and that, and that is uh, dealt with on an individual basis. And in fact, when that happened, because that did happen with the emergency care, somebody, didn't mm. it, that it was inappropriately accessed by a mm. medic. Um, 
that was fairly quickly spotted, wasn't it? It was. Um, reports, I believe, are run certainly within a month of all of our key systems. Um, and we move the key systems without staff knowledge of that we monitor. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is quite comprehensive and the emergency care summary is certainly available to our first responders. Um, but I do take Professor Buchanan's point that there could be more uh, social care information uh, provided within the emergency care summary. Yeah, and it's not available across the board to every health professional who might benefit from using it, like my own profession of pharmacy. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Marie Todd mentioned the, the recent situation at British Airways. Um, you know, it appears there that we, uh, the, uh, it was a power surge that caused the problem and some poor technicians carrying the can for something that happened across multiple sites. <coughs> you know, dozens if not hundreds of countries bring in that uh, airline to a, to a standstill. Um, assuming that British Airways being a profitable, large multinational company had many of the um, uh, backups in place that the NHS has. So therefore, leads me to the question, if it can happen there, can that happen here? I, I think it can happen with, with any, any organisation. As I said earlier, it is a very complex infrastructure that we have, lots of systems are dependent upon other systems, typically outside uh, Scotland, outside the UK. So a power failure in the east coast of the US would have devastating effects on the public sector in Scotland because we still are running things with inside uh, uh, the, the, the public cloud and also there are services such as DNS that would actually affect so I think most of the risks that we see are probably external risks. The concept of the firewall as a as the main protection for a company are, are going. And an IoT infrastructure, the, the firewall doesn't really exist anymore. They have 3G connections to, to the internet. So the, so the concept that you can corral them around a little network and protect them uh, has gone. So I think we, we do need to understand where the data is, what's critical when devices need to be patched. I think it can take up to a year for a device to be recalled in the NHS, for it to be patched if there's, a, if there's an error on it. Uh, so I, I, I think it is a really complex infrastructure and, and, and probably we just need to be much more dynamic in understanding the internal risks and also the, the external risks to the, to the infrastructure. Because rather than a loss of profit and a loss of, uh, of face for, for BA, we would see loss of lives, and that's much more important than than uh, the brand of a, of a company. So we'd be measuring a, a loss in terms of billions, really, if, if we had a large-scale power outage. And, and it's great to see that the NHS have things in place. But you know that when things happen, you just don't predict exactly what's going to happen. And you might be well-drilled in one area, but, but something else happens that you just didn't see. I think more and more we need to do more scenario based training we need to do we need to set up what's defined as a as a security range where you could actually simulate the NHS and what would happen if parts of it failed and see if our uh, our, our responders could actually cope with that MDL's care to comment or no, uh, it's very difficult for us to say that uh, that bad things won't happen, and it, it's it's very difficult for us to say that. that. Um, however, what we can say is is and, and give some assurance in terms of the fact that we we realise that I, I worked in private sector for many years before I joined the public sector, and the thing that strikes you when you work for the health service is realising that straight line between the job you do and, and the patient and keeping them safe, and the dependency that that the health service now has on IT. Um, it is enormous. Uh, it is very difficult for us to, to, to imagine uh, the health service operating without the IT infrastructure that it has. But we, we, we take that extremely seriously and, and the measures we put in place are, are, are fairly broad in terms of trying to protect us against what the industry and what the, the best practices in and around security and resilience are telling us. And, and hopefully in, in some of the written evidence you see the, the connections that we've got into the, the UK and to, to Scotland's uh, best minds on that. So we, 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 we try our best to, to cover the same as everyone else will. 
Um, in 2013, my col then colleague Richard Simpson asked questions to the Scottish Government about uh, consideration that had given to ending the provision of security support for earlier versions of Windows operating system and moving to an open source operating system. At that point, they said that um, uh, XP would be unsupported from 2014 and 86% of devices had been upgraded and the exercise completed in 2014. They then the answer goes on to say that um, in terms of the uh, uh, Microsoft, that no suitably mature, scalable and secure alternatives to Microsoft Windows and Outlook products were available. Is that still the case? Are there no alternatives? There are alternatives to, to Microsoft products, uh, that's for sure. Um, the, the issue we've got is, is in, uh, I'll take you back to the scale I just mentioned in terms of your installed base. Um, the, the installed base we have is enormous. Uh, the investment we have in, in Microsoft products is enormous. Um, we will continue to look at alternatives. Uh, now, when you say Microsoft, uh, it, it can depends whether we're talking about the, the operating systems or indeed some of the software that runs on them. Um, but largely speaking, uh, uh, you know, uh, that Microsoft is by far and away the, the predominant uh, operating systems that are used across industries and across governments uh, across the world. And everyone has the same issue as we've got. You, you would like to think that there is, a, is an alternative to Microsoft from, from the point of view of uh, competition and, and, uh, and that, that keeping the, 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 uh, uh, your, your choices current. Um, but the, the cost of, of moving on uh, from a, a Microsoft-based environment uh, would be enormous. Uh, and uh, and the benefits, um, uh, I'm not entirely convinced the benefits would outweigh the, the costs of moving. I think the concept of an operating system is, is old. That's legacy. That's, we now run with our mobile phone, our iPad. Many of us are running Android and, and Mac OS. So I, I think the concept of a Windows operating system in, 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 in a decade's time, it'll seem as old-fashioned as the abacus. Um, I think the server infrastructure around the NHS is more likely to be based on, on a Linux open source uh, platform. Much of the services will be built ar ar around that. Uh, so I, I, I think we need to understand that more clinicians and more nurses will probably be using portable devices that it may well be Windows, uh, and I think there are plans for, for, for Windows devices, but in, increasingly it will be a mobile in, environment. And those mobile environments have 3G connections that don't connect to the SWAN network and, and the NHS infrastructure. These are back doors. These are the way that a clinician can check on the internet to be able to see the, the best uh, uh, prescriptions and, and so on. So I, I think that day of everything's closed and you have a firewall and as long as the firewall was protecting the whole infrastructure everything's fine that's that's an old old world so i, I think the, the question that richard asked was a, was a valid one at that time typically around uh, the cost of licenses within the, the nhs but i think as we migrate it will be a mobile device that, that we use and we'll be connecting more and more in, 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 into a cloud so i think we really need to understand the changing nature of, of, of IT. Andy, yeah. Uh, uh, just coming there, and certainly from an Ayrshire and Aaron uh, view as a territorial board, we, we uh, our server estates are, are probably around about 99% Microsoft. Um, and that is purely because of our uh, clinical system vendors. They specify uh, Microsoft as an operating system, and there are very few alternatives out there. Uh, with one no notable exception in Scotland, but uh, aside from that, they, they're all Windows. Uh, and certainly going on to uh, Professor Buchanan's point regarding mobile devices, we use a number of mo mobile devices certainly coming uh, over external networks, and we always use a two-factor authentication there to, to secure that that link. Um, and I think that that's evidenced again in the in the. Uh, Lack of out, uh, an outbreak within Asher and Aaron, but uh, we we are we can only run at the at the pace of uh, clinical system vendors. Um, and finally, can I ask in terms of the the sort of churn of hardware and software, what's the kind of time scale that you look at in terms of writing stuff off and replacement? 
hardware and software. Uh, for desktop PCs uh, within Azure and Aaron, we, we currently work to, to a five-year time scale. However, due to some um, financial constraints, that, that's likely to drift. Um, and for the server estate, technical term. Drift. No, in terms of it will become a longer period than, than five years. Uh, our server estate is um, almost exclusively virtualized, and we replace the hosts on a five to six year basis, on a rolling basis. For most of our, our large scale uh, national applications, we're usually looking at contract terms around about seven years for the large scale software that runs on the infrastructure. But uh, infrastructure refresh typically runs on a five year cycle as, as a default. And is this, what's this, what would be the accepted IT standard, Professor Buchanan? Is there such a thing? I, I would hate to have the problem of of moving away from legacy and, and, and the NHS. I couldn't imagine how that can happen in a relatively small time period. But one thing I do know is that buying desktop PCs is not the way forward. Uh, the minute you put a desktop PC, you, you automatically fix something down. So I, I think we need to be thinking much more of a mobile type environment, an IoT. Uh, an environment and much more building systems around the citizen and that, that will take a lot of investment and a lot of time to, to do that. So I couldn't really comment on, on the cost of replacing PCs. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much. At several points during that, I was nodding along, pretending that I knew what you were talking about. I'm sure some of my colleagues were doing so as well. But thanks very much. It was very helpful this morning and we'll now uh, suspend briefly.
Uh, can I uh, welcome to the meeting uh, Shona Robertson, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, uh, Penny Rocks, Head of eHealth, Digital Health and Care Governance and Technical Strategy, and Graham Gall, eHealth, All Scottish Government. Could I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement? Uh, well, thanks, convener, for inviting me to attend the committee today. Uh, I certainly welcome the committee's interest in, in what was a, a significant incident that affected a, a number of health boards in Scotland. This was a, a global ransomware attack, which by its very nature was aimed at causing the maximum disruption to a large number of organisations across the world. But I do think it's worth acknowledging the extent of this incident across the UK and in particular the NHS. Across the NHS in England, some 47 health organisations were infected with the malware, including 27 of their acute trusts, while in Scotland, 11 territorial health boards, two national health boards and a number of GP practices experienced some impact from this attack, although uh, less severely than, than in England. Um, as we've already learnt from this attack, swift action and coordination and sharing information limited the impact on the NHS in Scotland. We must all therefore reflect upon this incident, identify the lessons and more importantly share these lessons with partners so that we can help each other to put in place the appropriate and effective measures to combat cybercrime. I want again to acknowledge the tremendous efforts of NHS staff and the wider public sector in responding to the ransomware attack and providing assurances around the security of their networks. I can reassure everyone that there were no reported breaches of pa patient data or personal details as a result of the attacks. There remains a UK-wide criminal investigation underway led by the National Cyber Security Centre and supported by Police Scotland. Health boards continue to fully support these inquiries. There will be a number of lessons arising from these attacks that we must learn from. Reviews are already underway to capture what can be improved to ensure that we reduce the chances of a similar attack happening in the future. The Scottish Government Cyber Resilience Unit will also be arranging a lessons learned exercise to help health boards and other agencies to mitigate the risks from further ransomware and other cyber attacks. There was considerable collaboration across the NHS as well as a cross-sector engagement during uh, this time. Collaboration at this level is an essential element and helps to demonstrate confidence in the public sector's ability to respond to such events. There has historically been strong collaboration between all e-health leads, e-health infrastructure leads and IT security teams, both nationally and regionally, on IT security issues, with meetings held on a regular basis. NHS National Services Scotland hosts a quarterly meeting called the National Information Security Forum, and this is attended by all IT security representatives from each board, and they discuss current threats and vulnerabilities and exchange intelligence. This cohesiveness was particularly helpful during the attack as security information was shared quickly and implemented immediately. Business continuity ideas were discussed and good practice shared across health boards and unaffected boards provided their security expert resource to help those that had been impacted. Further ideas are already being discussed around a more national approach to managing IT security across the boards and providing a systematic and regular intelligence briefing of potential attacks and vulnerabilities. Although we can't prevent another cyber attack from happening, we'll continue to minimise the risk and impact of future attacks. Initial assessment highlighted that across health boards, around 1% of devices were affected. This is around 1,500 devices. Of this total, some 1,100 were in NHS Lanarkshire. So this means that only 400 devices across the rest of NHS Scotland were actually affected by this attack. Of the 13 boards affected, NHS Lanarkshire was the most impacted. However, the board took appropriate precautionary action and along with other affected health boards put business continuity arrangements in place to ensure that patient services continue to be delivered across the NHS. While in investigations are still underway in NHS Lanarkshire, early indications are that their estate and patching regime was appropriate but they had not yet deployed the specific patch prior to the date of the attack that they were in the process of an extensive replacement program, hence why they were so badly affected. Lessons learned will be to improve the deployment time of critical patching, and this will be their focus going forward. 
There continues to be substantial investment in IT across the NHS, and the Scottish Government provides funding of around £100 million per annum to health boards for IT investment and for maintaining cyber security resilience. Health boards spend at least the same amount per annum, although further analysis of health board spending estimates that over £350 million was spent in 2016-17, and there is expected to be a similar level of investment uh, this year. Uh, although the attack was unprecedented in its scope, with hundreds of organisations affected across the globe, it was not an isolated incident, and the NHS, along with other organisations, face similar attacks every day, most of which are thwarted by the controls and protections that are in place. All health boards have IT security frameworks and policies in place, but the IT environment across health boards is complex with a mixture of legacy and new systems and technology. There's continuing work in place to ensure legacy systems are updated as soon as possible as developments in technology move on. However, some special medical devices still need to run on old IT and there are challenges around updating these. Health boards also have appropriate patching regimes in place. This is the process of applying fixes from software and hardware suppliers onto IT systems to improve uh, security. But I want to make clear that the adoption of any patches received from a supplier requires a technical assessment to ensure that there are no unintended consequences on IT systems. Uh, due to these criminal activities, the NHS and other parts of the public sector need to be vigilant and keep their systems up to date and fully protected at all times. Uh, just finally, uh, convener, in response to the attack, the National Cyber Resilience Leaders Board quickly convened an extraordinary meeting on the 16th of May to review the circumstances surrounding the attack, the multi-agency response to it, and to identify the next steps to ensure cyber resilience across all sectors. At that meeting, the board agreed to accelerate delivery of a public sector action plan, which it had been working on previously to help all Scottish public bodies develop a shared understanding and approach to achieving cyber resilience. The Board will present this action plan to Ministers shortly for their consideration, following which we would expect to consult at pace with the wider Scottish public sector on implementation. The plan is expected to include a commitment to develop clear minimum standards of cyber security for all Scottish public bodies to implement during 2017-18 and proposals to help provide assurance around higher standards of cyber resilience in key uh, public uh, bodies. So, in conclusion, can I thank you for the opportunity <coughs> to be here today and I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much. Uh, in any... Um area of health, there's a tension between um, centralisation of services and um, different boards having their own uh, systems in place. Um, but what we've heard um, from the previous panel is, is you know, that this is, this is life and death stuff and this is extremely important. It's, you know, um, so is there any move in which, or move towards having a more consistent system across Scotland? Yes, there is. And I'll let Graham say a bit more about that. Um, I mean, that has already been the, the direction of travel in terms of taking a, a Once for Scotland approach around uh, IT investment as well, making sure our systems are, are more joined up. So that has been the, the direction of travel. But, uh, you know, absolutely, we uh, also, I think, want to ensure that the monitoring of our systems is, is improved. I think I've laid out in my opening statement some of the resilience and oversight that there is, but I think there's always room uh, for improvement and the, the monitoring um, of, of systems and making sure that we have that, that continuity is, is very important. Graham, do you want to say a little bit more about certainly, the professional travel? Uh, certainly. The, so most of the boards already participate on a, on a very cooperative basis. Um, the 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 IT security officers for each health board participate on a regular basis, communicating with each other and the four nations, uh, the four home nations, to get the best advice out to all parties at all times. <clears throat> we uh, certainly are now looking at uh, how we can actually, never mind the, the impacts for the security and the standardisation of that, but even just the economy of scale and maybe pine product which can be more standardised and deployed across all sites, across all health boards and that's certainly a direction of travel I'll be looking into in the coming months. I suppose the follow on for that is that the, the words public sector IT procurement fill everyone with a, you know, with a chill. You, um, why are, are we bad at it or is that just a perception in the media? 
Is that just a portrayal in the media? Or are we really as poor as that would suggest? That One of the things we've not done is, I mean, we'll be aware of the, the big IT project down south that, that became a, a bit of a legendary tale of... of of something of its complexity was was too complex and has ran into uh, ran into severe difficulties. We've taken a different approach uh, in Scotland, and that is recognising the need to move to um, more um, continuity and uh, a, a once for Scotland approach, but not trying to overlay one big system uh, across the NHS um, that that would um, would have brought the challenges that they had down south. Um, Graham, certainly, and 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 I think more. Most importantly, um, product, a security product is already purchased off national framework agreements. So all boards will be buying security products consistently off of the same vendors. What we've got to get better at doing is knowing and managing these products and on the ground. And that's where the, the emphasis needs to be on uh, standardisation and actually given more guidance and advice from, from expertise, which we already have through NSS. We've got uh, security advisors who lead us through all this and also take uh, guidance and, and leadership when attacks do happen. When, when procurements, the process is going through, why is it that it appears that um, the public push carries a can for failure in public IT procurement that rather than the companies who are failing to provide what we want from them? I, I, I think that's improved. I think we are better, uh, with, particularly with NSS. Um, their, their skills around procurement uh, are able to drive, I think, a, a harder, better bargain on behalf of the public sector. Than, and I think lessons have been learned from perhaps previous uh, contracts where the, the balance wasn't right and that like, the, the, those who were selling had had all the information um, and there was an imbalance of power there. I think we've got much better at that and NSS's expertise in this has been really, really helpful. Certainly. And, and I mean, at the end of the day, economy of scale is, is, is you know, what we're aiming for and what larger suppliers may tend to do is divide and conquer health boards across the nation. And what's important for us that we keep together um, and then certainly across in Scotland, a lot of the bigger contracts more recently uh, on national frameworks uh, have been a lot more cohesive and well managed. Thank you. Um, in the previous session we had evidence from Professor Buchanan, and he, if I understood him correctly, um, and I caveat my following remarks with that, um, it was a trajectory um, which is a move away from fixed desktop infrastructure towards, if I have this right, um, virtual architecture and um, greater use of mobile devices. Is this a, a view shared by the government that this is where we're moving to? Yeah, I mean, there is a, a move towards what's called cloud-based solutions, but I'm going to ask Graham to talk about <laughs> yeah. the more technical aspects of that, if that's OK. Yeah, no problem. So virtualisation uh, is, very, is, is the modern uh, industry way of lowering costs, improving security and increasing reliability and availability of systems. So most health boards for their core components, their, more, their core infrastructure, are now virtualising all their environment. So that's pretty much in place. Um, what we vary in is, is, the, is how we actually uh, deliver that, um, how we manage that on an ongoing basis and how we can improve that. Um, and so what, what the most important component is, is that uh, st the staff training that goes behind that is new for people. So it's about get, making sure staff are up to date. But uh, infra uh, infrastructure now across NHS in Scotland is pretty modern. Um, and, and, a whole, and that's why and a lot of the, the issues that, and the, the impact of this uh, attack was, was certainly minimised. From the server point of view, the, the, the reporting is about the desktop, which is the end users, where, where there was some, some, some deviancy. It's maybe just worth mentioning as well that in terms of the upgrade and replacement of, of the IT systems used by GPs, um, the, there's a procurement underway with um, completion uh, delivery for about 2019-20 on the new GPIT and community IT systems, which are cloud-based uh, solutions. So that's mm. going to really be quite a big, big difference to the way GP uh, practices um, IT systems are are uh, are configured and how they work. 
Mm -hmm. And just finally, uh, Professor, if you can, uh, stated that you believe there's a need for significant um, investment of resources in the infrastructure, overall infrastructure. Um, I think there was a, a num number given of 15 million, you said add a zero, then another zero to it. Is that a sort of amount of investment that you recognise as being necessary? If you, if you take the figure I, I used in my opening statement, that actually when we've looked at what boards actually spent mm -hmm. um, in 2016-17, in it was £350 million. So if you're to look ahead to the next five years of that spend, that's about £1.5 mm -hmm. So it is a lot of zeros. Uh, what's important, though, is how that money's spent. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the, the list uh, um, of, of the companies and organisations that were impacted from this cyber attack, I mean, some of them are, you know, multi-million pound, billion pound organisations that spend huge amounts on cyber security and IT. What's important for the NHS is, is, is yes, we need to make sure the resources are at are, are an appropriate level, but it's also about what it's spent on is important. And if you, you could spend billions of pounds, but if you spend them on the wrong thing, you're not mm -hmm. going to get the systems that you need and you're not going to get the security that you need. So it's as important about what it's spent on as, as much as how much it is spent. Yes. And just to add to that, uh, I think the ambitions of NHS Scotland are significant. I think we want to do the best job for the, the population in, in delivering efficient uh, uh, good services, and that is a never-ending challenge. So perhaps the reference of future investment will reflect the fact that we have an ambitious, an ambitious programme here, which we, we certainly want to um, invest in to, to, to ensure that it delivers for the, for the population. Thank you. Colin? Good morning to the, the panel. Uh, Cameron Secretary, you, you made reference to the NHS in England uh, and the fact that you thought that, that, that we handled it or weren't impacted as much uh, the recent cyber attack in Scotland as well in England. But in his evidence to uh, the committee, Professor Bill Buchanan uh, from the School of, of Computing at Edinburgh University stated in a quote, Scotland seems to be behind England in the creation of a robust, modern and dynamic healthcare infrastructure. He goes on to say there's a general lack of citizen access with weaknesses around the integration of primary and secondary healthcare uh, along with a general lack of integration with social care. Do you think that's a, a fair criticism? Um, I, I don't think it is. I mean, first of all, can I just say that all like, all of our health systems were in one way impacted in another, and this isn't a you know I think it's about us all learning lessons and actually learning lessons from each other as well. There were maybe aspects of 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 cyber security that for England and Wales um, may have uh, better than us, and it's about the four the four nations really learning lessons from each other, and um, there's a lot of work going on at a UK level to, to make sure those lessons are learned and there's a, a coordination uh, there. Um, but in terms of the, the citizen access issue, when one of the there's a lot of work going on in Scotland uh, around that. We have the GP Spire programme, for example, which is, uh, and I actually think that was a good example of, of taking the public uh, with us when it was a, a big new uh, data system uh, and it was important that the public understood what the purpose of that was so there was a lot of work that went on around explaining that uh, to to the public and as I mentioned a few minutes ago the investment in the the IT systems uh, in the new GP IT and community IT systems that's very much about linking up primary and secondary care it's going to be um, a cloud-based uh, solution so it's at the cutting edge of technology uh, and that work that procurement is well underway. So um, I, I think also if you look across NHS England, yes, there will be pockets of very, very good practice, but it's quite a, a, a disparate system. It's not one that's particularly joined up. Trusts uh, very much do uh, their own thing. Um, so I think there are pockets of good practice um, which we would want to learn from, but um, I'm not sure I would um, make the, the comparison uh, in the, the way that Professor has. Just, just to complement that, that comment, there, there's 20 do obviously health boards in Scotland and every single month we as a group of professionals meet in the same room sharing working together and uh, making sure that we're all bringing services to the fore no, nobody's falling behind um, and any new technologies are well discussed well um, embraced and and sometimes we do trials in one health board and then share that across others so we're a very cohesive group and hopefully the committee can recognize that um, that brings a lot of strength and a lot of structure to, to how we deliver our services. 
Okay. Just on that point, though, it was clear from the evidence this morning, and just even clear from looking at the impact in health boards, that some health boards were impacted more than others. So quite clearly, whatever best practice guidance we have, it wasn't rolled out universally at the same time by every health board. There were obviously um, lessons that should be learned, so it's not a case that everything happened perfectly at every health board. I, don't know I, think. Saying that. I think no. in my opening remarks, I was very clear to say that we had challenges, absolute challenges, lessons must be learnt and improvements need to be made. So, you know, there is absolutely no complacency whatsoever. But if you look at the, you know, the 1,500 devices that were impacted, and as I said earlier, 1,100 of those were within Lanarkshire. In my opening statement, I tried to give a bit of, of analysis now um, that we have more information about why that happened. And, and essentially, because they were upgrading their system, Systems, the security around those systems while they were being upgraded wasn't as good as it should have been. And that's why 1,100 of the 1,500 devices were within the one health board. And the lesson from that is that when systems are being upgraded, the security around those systems needs to be better. And that lesson will now be learned across the whole of the system. But it does give some explanation uh, about why NHS Lanarkshire was impacted more than other boards um, in the way it was. And just looking at it, I think everybody is in agreement that in order to upgrade our systems, moving to virtual systems, for example, is going to cost a significant sum of money at the moment. The government provides £100 million, but as you said earlier, uh, boards probably spend over £300 million in total. So that obviously comes from other parts of the, the, the health service budget. What assessment has the government made specifically about how much it's going to cost over the next five years? to get to where you want to be around the use of virtual systems. I mean, presumably the government are setting budgets for, 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 for the next few years, um, but so what specific assessment of how much this is going to cost over the next five years the government made? Um, as I said earlier on in, in answer to, to Tom Arthur, that you know, the, the spend in 2016-17 was, uh, was over £350 million, and we could anticipate a, a similar level of spend in 17-18. Now, if, even if you were to take that at least that level of spend over five years, you're talking about over 1.5 billion. But what we'll also be doing as part of the analysis of the, the lessons learned from the cyber attack, but also in terms of the IT investment going forward, we've got the new digital health uh, strategy that'll be launching at the end of the year. We will uh, keep under constant review any further resource requirements, whether that's in capital or resources. But, you know, it's fair to say that we are already, there is already a lot of resources going into the system. And I would just make the point again, it's it's important about where those resources are, are spent as much as, as the level of those resources. And that's why the priority in uh, with procurement that's on uh, the go at the moment with a completion time frame of 2019-20 is in the new GP IT and community IT systems because that interface with secondary care is so important and also the fact that the move and shift towards uh, doing more in the community, more patients being treated in the community requires the IT infrastructure to support that and that is why the, the focus at the moment is on that in terms of that being a key priority. I hear what's been said about the amount of money that's spent at the moment, but at this morning's session, um, Andy Robertson, obviously Director of IT at NHS National Services Scotland, made the point that he believed that it would require an extra 50% on top of the £100 million pounds alone um, in order to deliver where he thought we needed to be. Uh, and Professor Bill Buchanan said we need to add a zero and possibly another zero to that. So I'm just trying to get to the bottom whether the government have actually made an assessment as to how much you think is required over the next five years to get to where you want to be in terms of IT. I mean, those assessments are done on an ongoing basis. Obviously, there'll be mo further work being done now in the light of the cyber attack, and that work is ongoing um, to make sure that in terms of the lessons learned and any additional resources, uh, that that is identified. So that work is ongoing as part of the detailed analysis of, of how we ensure a, 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 an improved level of resilience, um, not just in the NHS, but across the public sector. The digital health strategy uh, going forward will obviously lay out the, the key priorities and the resources will follow that um, and you know we will make sure that in terms of the what needs to be done in the prioritization of that that the resources are sufficient to, to meet that need I mean you, you know you could um, I just make the point though that you could add 
zero after zero after zero uh, on to how much you spend on IT infrastructure and on cyber security measures. But if you're not spending them in the right way, then as you can see by the global companies like you know Telefonica, FedEx, you know, Deutsche Bahn, all of those organisations, those companies were impacted by the cyber attack and they spend huge amounts of money uh, on, on uh, cyber uh, security. So it's about making sure that we have the intelligence as much as we can to spend the money in the right way, however, however much uh, we uh, we resource. So, you know, we'll keep these things under review. We are, as I say, there's a big process of learning the lessons and very, very detailed analysis of what more we need to do in the NHS and the public sector. And, and uh, the resource element of that is a key component. Yeah. Just to, to add to that, I mean, we are no different than any other business in that if we are developing and evolving services for improved efficiency, then yes, it will require further investment. The, um, the, the business case has to stack up, is without a question. We have to take informed uh, decisions on how, what we invest in and how we invest it. But the ambition, as I said earlier, is very, uh, we have great ambitions for engaging in, in, in digital services within the NHS in Scotland. And, and over time that will uh, induce more demand on infrastructure, it will put more demand on security requirements, but these will these components will be built into how we fund and, and how we how, how we deliver the, the case going forward. I don't think anybody's saying that we should spend money on things that don't work, but what, what I'm just trying to get to the bottom of, if, you, if you've got great ambitions to do what we need to do, I'm just not entirely sure why you don't know how much that will cost over the next few years. Well, we've had to review in the light of the cyber attack um, the cyber resilience and there may be additional costs out of that where well, that work is ongoing at the moment so you know you would expect us us to do that in a very detailed and forensic way and that's what we're doing um, in terms of the the IT infrastructure commitments already made I mean there's a prioritization of those so that's why we're prioritizing the GP and community IT systems that's all costed that is all the procurement is ongoing at the moment with a delivery time frame of 1920 so uh, you know they're within the whole IT infrastructure spend there are a series of priorities um, and those are laid out and there will be further detail of that going forward for the next five years in the digital health strategy that will be launched at the end of this year which we can keep the committee obviously informed about okay um, you mentioned that there has been an IT assessment at, at, um I wonder if that you can provide that to the committee, or, or that assessment, and also whether you could provide us with um, details of the um, the global IT budget uh, and the, what the figure is for IT security as well. If you could follow up with that information, that'd be helpful. Okay. Uh, Miles. Um, thank you, Kamina. I wanted to um, follow up on sort of bench benchmarking of these IT projects. Um, I was made aware of Y1 and Y2 medical students in Lothian um, all being given iPads um, when they first um, started working for NHS Lothian. But they report that there's no Wi-Fi across the Lothian estate, so they haven't really been much use. I can see the opportunity there, but to what extent are we actually looking at infrastructure like Wi-Fi across the NHS estate, and when will, when will that be in place, really? Sure. Um, again, uh, with the decentralisation of funding, the Scottish Government provide uh, health boards with investment uh, and there is local choice and the, you're correct to, to say that the variabilities of what uh, health boards spend money on um, varies. Um, some health boards are fully compliant and most right across their acute services. Um, some health boards are not. Some health boards are currently victims of challenge on things like uh, pay for TV, where they've got maybe long, long established contracts and they, they, they breach their contract by deploying Wi-Fi into their acute bed areas. Um, so there's lots of uh, complexities in just been saying, you know, when can we get broad, you know, when can we get Wi-Fi across all our services? So, so it's, it's a complicated picture. Um, certainly from colleagues uh, in eHealth, their ambition is to mobilise the workforce, again, for efficiency purposes uh, in, in the acute hospitals and also out into community. And that's certainly a focus of where our investment will be. 
fair to say um, that in Glasgow and Clyde particularly, the, um, the clinicians' use of mobile devices is very advanced, so they'll use those regularly to be checking up on test results and um, for communication. So I guess what we need is, in terms of benchmarking is to get the, that as a standard and get all, all boards to the standard that we would expect, um, and mobile devices you know, and the use of uh, of uh, you know of cloud-based um, systems is is the way of the future, and obviously the broadband and, and connectivity is a key part of that. So mm -hmm. it's pretty essential. And another area which um, has been my pet project is kind of around GP appointments and text messaging reminders. Um, could you give us an update where that is across Scotland and improvements, given the fact that I think the latest figure showed there was a million missed appointments? So £2 million pounds has been directly provided uh, through primary care investment to invest in online services like booking appointments and other system enhancements. Uh, and the G GPIT infrastructure um, uh, that I talked about earlier is, you know, is going to, I think, revolutionise the the way GP services, um, and te certainly in terms of the, the digital element of them, uh, is organised, and also the interface with secondary care. So, you know, that will be in place. Uh, completion timeframe of nine. 2019-20 um, uh, but meantime there's also uh, work going on around the, in improving the, 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 the booking appointments and, and other systems. I think people expect that level of, of IT literacy if you like in terms of how they, they interact with services and we've got a, a bit of catch up to do there in our primary care services but it is a priority. I suppose just to just to add to that, the the funding that the cabinet secretary has mentioned there um, has been decentralised. There is a uh, you know all the product, all the services, all the servers that are running in general practice in Scotland today have the ability to handle online appointment booking. There is a choice at practice level. Some practices go for things like that. Some practices a little bit more resistant. So there is a, but, but certainly now that there's, there's positive funding being made available, things we're hoping that things pick up and accelerate. Yeah. And do you think that will be a postcode situation though? That, you know, with the 22 different boards that some will say this is what we want to do and others will say it's not our priority? Oh, I, I think as part of the funding, because we're putting additional funding in, that is a real um, a, a carrot, I guess, to to get yeah, to to going down that that route and the investment in the IT infrastructure within uh, general practice more broadly. The the big project by by nineteen twenty, I think, will um, encourage the the best use of the technology. And um, you know, and, and the interface between primary and secondary care that is going to be so critically important in terms of saving time, of sharing information, um, and the patient should get a better and quicker uh, ex um, uh, experience because of that that infrastructure. Okay, thank you. We did stray a bit from IT security there, but <laughs> um, uh, Claire. Thank you, convener. Um, can I uh, remind? Uh, uh, committee members of my register of interest and place on uh, record my thanks to the NHS staff who worked through their cyber attack. Um, we've received written submissions and uh, verbal uh, submissions um, to the committee about staff working overtime during this, um, heard of staff goodwill and I'm sure knowing the NHS staff many of them worked above and beyond what was expected of them. Um, with that in mind, um, can uh, the panel please tell me what assessment the Scottish Government's made of the impact an attack like this has on staff wellbeing and what steps can be taken um, to ensure that staff wellbeing won't be compromised should a similar situation arise? Well, I think it was a huge effort that, uh, that, that went in over that weekend and I, I know because I was involved in, in many calls um, early mornings, late at night and st staff were working Twenty, you know, right through the night in some cases, particularly in Lanarkshire, I have to say, and I would want to pay particular uh, tribute to to the staff. It was all hands on deck, and as quite often it is within the NHS, that that tends to be the, what happens. Uh, and due recognition has been given. We've thought we've certainly have written to the boards to thank and ask for my thanks to be passed on to those uh, all staff, but particularly those who who uh, went um, beyond uh, beyond the call of duty and uh, you know, we would expect 
certainly um, boards to be to be recognising those efforts. We, we've not had any information about there being any impact on staff wellbeing uh, um, as such, and you know, um, so uh, I I don't have any particular concerns in in that direction. But I think you know we should recognise that um, you know these are unusual events. They don't happen. You know, we've not had events like thankfully touch wood happening every day of the week um but it is important that we make sure that staff are, are recognized for for their efforts um i mean the cabinet secretary is right that i mean this attack has totally unprecedented we've we were caught um at uh, you know 12 30 on the 12th of may um and it did take most of the e-health resource across the entire service to respond um, and that meant they weren't doing what they would be doing normally on a, on a Friday afternoon. Um, and uh, I think without doubt that the, the, kind of the sharing and the support, certainly coordinated through Scottish Government um, and NSS, uh, I must mention that specifically, a uh, fantastic resource. It really showed that we were working as a team, we're working together, and it got to the point that a lot of the, the teams were even willing to go to other health boards. I know Lothian staff uh, went down to Borders to help them just to get through the, the, the blip of the challenge, so unprecedented attack. And I think the going forward, um, obviously planning and more sharing of and, and knowledge uh, transfer is, is key to that. I thank the, the panel for that um, response. My own constituency is uh, sits within NHS Lanarkshire, so I'm well aware of, of some of the, the difficulties that, that the attack threw up. Professor Buchanan at the previous panel um, spoke about um, his uh, thoughts about what, how the way forward and mentioned an instant response team. And I was wondering if the uh, panel had any thoughts on whether that could be a way forward to help coordinate response across NHS Scotland? Kind of, well, we have that already through our resilience arrangements. So when something happens, there is a, the immediate response team, if you like, is a resilience team and it mobilises, depending on what the, 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 the challenge is, it mobilises the right people in the right places. In this case, obviously, the e-health uh, leads were, were critical um, uh, part of that but I think those arrangements have stood us in good stead when we've had previous challenges whatever the nature of them that we've had to respond to so I think lessons will be learned in terms of whether you know we need to t tighten up on any of that but I think our our, uh, our way of responding to these um, very very challenging circumstances is is probably works, well, does does work mm -hmm. pretty uh, effectively. Worth also adding that um, the levels of defence and the level of protection and, and ultimately monitoring that you can do on computer networks, we're certainly going to look into that a lot more. Mm -hmm. the, the, the kind of standards or the banding goes that if, if you get into protecting, well, you're, you're, you're protecting your assets, which is probably where we're pitching at the moment. What's important, though, is that we're getting much more into event management, which is about knowing what attacks are happening when and uh, having then much more control, being able to identify them in real time to do something about it. Um, and that whole intelligence uh, is certainly something we're going to be focusing on in the coming months. Thank you. Alison. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, good morning. Um, I think Professor Buchanan made it clear in his evidence that he is concerned about a lack of investment. And he said, said that the main lesson we've learned is that from the ransomware attack is that there is a complete underinvestment in the delivery of an IT infrastructure in the NHS. And I suppose one key resource really is is staff and we've been speaking about them and um, Claire Hawhey raised concerns about the impact on staff well-being when they're not only working overtime but working overtime in a pressurised stressful situation where something's you know gone wrong and we're trying to contain it so um, Professor Buchanan spoke about the fact that experts in this field are in short supply generally not just in healthcare but particularly in healthcare obviously there's challenges when you're up against you know, huge financial organisations with larger budgets to attract the people with the necessary skills, these specialised skills. So I'd quite like to understand what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that we are attracting people. Um, I suppose some of it might be, you know, people are attracted to work in the NHS for all sorts of reasons, but are we doing enough to attract those with, 
you know, non-traditional sort of medical skills, people with other skills. Yeah, um, Graeme, can we say a little bit about that, that specifically? I think I think we need to, you know, it's worth re-emphasising again about how unusual an event this was. So our staff are not working like this in normal peacetime, if you like. This was a huge cyber attack that required an, a, a response uh, that was unusual in, in nature as well. And yeah, you're absolutely right to recognise that the pressure that put on people, but the, you know, as Graham outlined uh, earlier on, the, res the response was absolutely fantastic and, and, uh, uh, and first class. Um, the, the, the expertise being in short supply, yeah, I think that that's absolutely true. Uh, and sometimes uh, you're, we need to attract to the public sector generally, not just the NHS, people who are at the cutting edge, if you like, of understanding cyber uh, security. And that means us competing with the private sector organisations to, to get the right people. I mean, there are programmes of work where people are brought in to test some of those systems who have particular skills and they're brought in to, 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 to be frank, test whether the resilience uh, is as good as it should be, but Graham, do you want to say a little bit about this certainly, personnel? Certainly, um, yeah, I think I think you've touched on a a, a real point there of, of um, um, what we typically do. Going back to the fact that we collaborate across all the health boards, well, you, nobody finds themselves in a place where they're they're kind of stuck or they're not knowing what to do. Um, the security forums, the the gatherings, the 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 the, the, the month and month meetings, the support these guys give each other. Um, is, is significant. It is really, really, really positive. Um, I don't hear uh, people saying they can't get security officers. Um, I think we grow our own. I think we've got a very unique environment. I think we've got a very, very complicated uh, IT environment. And I think it's important that the model of, of sharing um, and also, as Cabinet Secretary says, a significant use of external professionals is used in this area. And it is certainly, you know, not not an apology for that. In, in the basis that this industry is changing so fast, the experts, the the technologies we have to deploy, um, is changing so fast. Uh, it is very difficult to keep up to speed uh, speed with things. And certainly, external penetration testing of of you know just <coughs> testing us. That's when we that's when we go out and hire external hackers. Uh, ethical hackers to come in and try and penetrate our networks and they will learn us so much from that and take their guidance and direction at that point in time. So it's a, it's a great big package of approach to actually solve what I think you've, you've identified as a, as a known real issue in, in the industry. Okay, I mean, Healthcare Improvement Scotland um, spoke of creating a centre of excellence. Um, is that something that's been looked yeah. at? Sorry, Captain Secretary, just to to say, I feel we're already well down that road. We have got uh, ex experts in NSS who work for, as mentioned, Andy Robertson, the director, and Andy coordinates his team in support of all health boards across the country. So we have got um, we have got expertise at our disposal on a daily basis. Uh, but yes, again, I think in, in enhancing skills and training and awareness for these key staff is is, is, is important. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Final. Point. Did, did the resilience and contingency planning work as you expected it? Um, I I think this as a whole was a, a very major success story for NHS Scotland. I think the impact uh, that happened was was under and most importantly, the recovery time was very very short indeed. Um, there was an impact, there's no, no question about that in terms of, of, of patient care, but the impact and the recovery time to put services back to normal was very, very quick indeed. Yeah, but what um, I asked was, did you prepare for such, a, such a, an event happening and did the preparations you had put in for that such an event, did they follow through? <laughs> yeah, I, I think from the resilience arrangements kicking in, um, with all of the um, that, that goes with that in terms of the, the the national response, the response locally. So, for example, the the move on to pay, the, the the backup systems in Lanarkshire, for example, that worked really well when the, the when the acute, the IT systems were down. Um, the staff got got in onto those uh, backup systems really quickly to minimise the impact on patient care. 
uh, and then the, the mutual aid, if you like, across the system, as you would expect. So, you know, don't get me wrong, there are lessons to be learned around what, what more what could have been done better. But I think if you were to, if we had been laying out a kind of theoretical uh, you know, uh, um, uh, attack and the response to it, I don't think we'd be far off in terms of what happened, how it was coped with, uh, the recovery time and then you know the, the analysis afterwards I think it would be pretty much in line with what the expectation would have been um, but you know we are not complacent we absolutely want to make sure that uh, we could you know it, it could work even better uh, next time by learning some of the lessons from this okay uh, thank you very much for coming along this morning we'll suspend briefly just to change the panel thank you Uh, agenda item three is subordinate legislation uh, and it's the consideration of one affirmative instrument. As usual with affirmative instruments we will have an uh, evidence session with the cabinet secretary uh, who doesn't have her officials with her today, she's going to do that herself. Um, they, uh, that will be followed by a formal debate on the motion. Uh, the instrument we're looking at is the Carers Scotland Act 2016 Agreements of a Specified Kind Regulations 2017 draft. Uh, can I welcome to the committee Shona Robertson, Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health and Sport. Um, can I invite an opening statement from the Cabinet Secretary? Thanks, uh, convener, for the opportunity to speak about this regulation under the Carers Scotland Act 2016. It's always been our intention that kinship carers should not be excluded from support for carers under the Act. This regulation is to clarify that kinship carers who have a formal agreement with a local authority can be seen as a carer under the Act, where they also meet the other requirements of the definition. In particular, this ensures that they are on an equal footing with parents who would only be seen as carers where the care required is over and above that which would normally be expected for a child of that age. Clarifying the definition of carer now will assist local authorities in developing their local eligibility criteria under the Act from October. Uh, the meaning of carer in the Carers Act excludes people who are caring under or by virtue of a contract. This regulation will ensure that uh, an agreement between a local authority and a kinship carer under Regulation 12 of the Looked After Children Scotland Regulations 2009 is not a contract for the purposes of defining a carer under the Act. Without this regulation, these formal kinship carers may have been considered to have a contract to provide the care, excluding them from the definition of carer. Given that kinship carers who have no formal arrangement in place with the local authority cannot be legally considered to be caring under a contract, there is no similar potential barrier to them falling within the definition of carer under the Act. To be clear, there is no suggestion that kinship carers who meet the definition of carer in the Carers Act will forfeit any other type of support they might receive. Any new support under the Carers Act would be in addition to existing support. It's always been our intention that kinship carers are not excluded from the definition of carer in the Act for a number of reasons. Feedback from stakeholders has supported this approach. 
Kinship carers often find themselves undertaking a caring role after a family member has fallen into crisis, feeling that they have little choice in the matter with the only alternative being the child is taken into formal care arrangements and no payment is received for the caring they undertake. The kinship care allowance is not a fee paid for providing care like foster carers receive, but for accommodation and maintenance of the child or young person in their care. Any support provided through the Carers Act will be aimed at supporting the needs of the carer. In conclusion, I'm clear that kinship carers should not be excluded from the support available to carers under the Carers Act. We are therefore putting forward these regulations to ensure that kinship carers who have formal agreements with a local authority can fall within the definition of carer under the Act. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions from members? Nope. We then move on to agenda item four, which is the formal debate on the affirmative SSI, in which we've just taken evidence. Uh, members should not put questions to the Minister during the formal debate. Uh, can I invite the Minister to move motion S5M06069? I move that the Health and Sport Committee recommends that the Carers Scotland Act 2016 agreements of a specified kind, Regulations 2017 draft, be approved. OK. Any members wish to contribute? Nope. Uh, the question is that uh, motion S5M06069 be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. Uh, thank you very much. And we will now move into private session. <laughs>